my screen's a bit too the, the sort of way that the way the tab fits my screen it sometimes cuts off the recording symbol but yeah mm. um just think in, in case we include the sort of start bit we've just been discussing um the long short vowel distinction in latin and um whether the short vowels were lax or not um and i think that you, you have done a video on that haven't you because i think i've heard you explain. i have and i was thinking i need to um update it actually because uh i've um i it's mostly just kind of a blathering rant uh it was years ago and i've I remember become more sophisticated i think in how i express this idea <laughs> maybe today it'll be more sophisticated but um I sometimes yeah, if you like we can uh go over what we just talked about again we could, yeah we could do if you yeah if you're happy to do that although i really i am yeah. all too happy to talk about uh lax vowels question mark in latin <laughs> <laughs> is that the title of the that's the other little little title well um so uh the so i actually have uh I, I like to show them i like to kind of point out look at me i have books uh i can read no i'm just kidding um well, i'm not not exactly yeah, just you in the sense that, that these are two sort of um uh contrastive examples of where one can get this kind of information and one of the really common ones um that's common that is a lot, it's this is a, a sh relatively short manual it's uh, written by the wonderful and famous Sidney Allen, who is an outstanding um, classicist, philologist, uh, researcher into this, uh, the topic of um, ancient uh, pronunciation of Latin, reconstruction of the classical pronunciation, something that had been ongoing since Erasmus it's from, say, circa 1500, and is still ongoing because it's an interesting field of research that doesn't really end, which is really cool. Contrasting that with um, this book, as well as some others by Jan Adams, which are you know not nearly as friendly um and certainly not to any spider which may be walking through your house um so the uh <laughs> the uh it's kind of, I, I contrast those because the findings of jan adams which um both of whom i think have had formerly when uh when he was alive uh, the great former Sidney Allen and the currently also great Jan Adams have the same seat at Cambridge, I believe, but they um, both published the books through Cambridge for sure. So the new evidence, if you will, is a really interesting statistical analysis, statistical analysis that Jan Adams has done in the past um, couple of decades, looking specifically at frequency of spelling errors, because the um, we're talking about lax vowels, right? So the question is, in Latin, the short letter vowel I, that is E, should be E or E, and the short letter U, should it be U or U. Um, and the way it's reconstructed, according to Sidney Allen, and the way it's reproduced by native speakers of English and German, which have those lax vowels, is to have them. Now, what's interesting is this gives uh, Latin spoken or recited by native speakers of English or German or Dutch a characteristically Germanic or Anglophone sound which ends up interestingly being derided by say Italians or Spaniards who hear it and they think, well, why would you do that? Not knowing that it's actually prescribed very specifically by Sidney Allen. Now my contention for a number of years is I didn't really buy that, but I didn't have the evidence to really um, prove it until the past uh, few years working with my uh, dear friend, uh, the linguist, uh, Raphael Torrigiano, who's uh, just a, a, a tremendous uh, uh, font of knowledge. Um, and a uh, wonderful fellow who's so good at describing these things. Um, the, so the, uh, the question is, well, why would we prescribe um, something like that? One example would be, well, what do the Romance languages do? Italian, for example, the word for pair is pera, and it comes from Latin pirum, that's my pronunciation of pirum, which would lead people to think, including Sidney Allen, oh, it must have been pirum, pirum, with an e, pirum, before it became, uh, uh, and the plural is, is, um, was, uh, so they use the plural form and they just generalize it to the, the feminine, uh, la pera in modern Italian. And there are similar transformations in the Romance, uh, the Western Romance languages, uh, for the U vowel. Um, what is an example I can think of? Um, uh, dotto, which is from Latin, ductus, means lead, dotto in Italian, uh, like an aqueduct. Uh, for example, water, a, a water lead uh, aqueduct, dotto, which is an o, a closed o, as opposed to the open o, which frequently comes from either a short o 
uh, in Latin or au, like the word causa, causa in Italian meaning thing, comes from Latin causa, for example. Uh, so the uh, the evidence it really we see this 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 change of the short uh, lax vowels of e and u into e and o that absolutely occurred. The question is what happened between was there an e and u transition, which is what Sidney Allen proposes, um, or is it as Andrea Calabrese, Professor Calabrese uh, proposes in his uh, paper he wrote a few years, which I made the video about the Calabrese system, which demonstrates, hey, if that happens, then you have to explain Sardinian and Southern Lucanian and the ancient North African Romance language, which uh, went extinct um, after the uh, Arab colonization of uh, Tunisia. Um, how can it be that um, Sardinian retains e and u, where Italian does does e and o? Okay, well, it means that Sardinian, which derives from originally from a yet older version of Latin, which got isolated during the uh, mid late Republican period, start, starting in the late third century, second century, first century, so second first century just before the, the Republican or that beginning of the golden age of classical Latin that everybody is so obsessed with, not for wrong, bad reason, you know, Cicero, Caesar, they're all really interesting. Um, Ovid, Virgil, you know, could tell us they're all great stuff. But if uh, the, the interest of reconstructing Latin as, a, um, as a, uh, a pronunciation is because, oh, we want to construct the pronunciation of those authors, which is very reasonable. Simon, I haven't let you speak for a while. I, I apologize. I'm, I'm kind of getting on my... <laughs> <laughs> on a roll. Okay, please interrupt me anytime. I apologize oh, for uh, for um, bogarting the mic. No worries. Um, these explanations. <laughs> thanks. Um, yeah, but please interrupt if I'm not making anything clear. If I'm, I get two in my head sometimes of these. So, um, so the uh, so e and u, or we letter i, letter u become a o in Italian, French, Spanish, Portuguese with regularity, but u remains. U very regularly in Romanian. In fact, even the au diphthong, which becomes a regularly in Italian, let's say Latin aurum, becomes Italian auro, and similar transformations in Western Romance doesn't happen in Romanian. Aurum in Latin is aur in Romanian. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. That's, and the, please. I, I was just going to say that's one of those sounds that sounds characteristically Latin to me. And I, I was, yeah, I didn't realize that it was preserved in. in in the positions that it was in in Latin, in um, any of its descendants. Yeah, yeah owl, and so the back vowels, o, um, the uh, o, so o also short, o gets turned into wo regularly. Um, uh, for example, um, focus is the hearth in a house. And that word gets used as the word for fire in Romance languages. Um, it was definitely in, in vulgar Latin. I have a video the whole about vulgar. Vulgar Latin can be a useful term if we're using it uh, carefully. And I think I'm using it carefully enough. Uh, this is the the non-standard um, spoken Latin, common spoken Latin was already using in the imperial age, clearly was using uh, focus for fire uh, to some degree because it's also in Romanian and probably a lot of Romanian comes from from uh, late imperial Latin, when it was all one united language and just different registers and dialects of the same language, which then of course developed separately after the fall of the um, uh, Western Roman Empire. So the um, so since Romanian has foc, which sounds funny in English, it's foco in Italian and you know uh, fuego and so forth in Spanish. Um, that that's we have the change of the o into wo. We say Italian buono, which comes from Latin bonus. Uh, short O gets uh, the vowel breaking of O into wall. Now, the, that vowel breaking of the back vowel doesn't happen in Romania. It's foc, not foc, which is very interesting. And the, whereas the vowel breaking of, um, I can't, I'm trying to think of a good example, uh, would be, say, E, which becomes ye. That does occur in Romania. So front vowels go through all the same changes as Western Romance, but not the back vowels. Now, in or what that means, if we have um, if we have u that remains u in Romanian, and u that remains u in Sardinian, and in other samples, why would it come from u? 
Yeah, why would it have relaxed itself at some point in the history? Why would it have gone to a lax vowel and then gone back to its original quality? Right. The, say, proto-Latin quality, which would be E and U for both, and then they've gone through a lax stage, hypothetically. Um, so I question, and I, I frankly need to do more research, I question the necessity of having that specific lax vowel set of E and U as the transitionary set. Can't you simply slide down that vowel chart uh, where you're going from E and we need to get to E? Yeah. Can you just go to E? Go straight there. You have to go to E, E, E. I, my con I conjecture and Calabrese also conjectures no. Um, and also from, from U to O, can you slide down the back side of the chart from E to O? Or do you have to do, so I said this that badly, I said wrongly, but I said that wrong. Do you have to go from U to O? through uh, or can you just go directly and that's the um, that is the question that is worth asking and i'm personally convinced that's the simpler solution but you know a lot more about germanic languages where this happens all the time well, i i i also am kind of a loss we were talking before about um how uh, there's a, a similar suggestion of lax um, vowels in Old English because certain, uh, I, I've thought of a couple of examples. So the word bitela, which has short e in Old English. Can you say the word again? Bitela. 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 What does it mean? Well, I'm, I'm not sure if the t would be aspirated, but it means beetle. Um, but you'd expect that to be, so So in, in by, by the Middle English period, that seems to have e, so like beetle. Um, and that's that's what you'd expect from the Old English word under a normal sort of de developmental um yeah and uh, that that's how it that's what e in modern english would normally develop from in old english because the great vowel shift raise a e, long a e to e um that's fascinating but, it's identical to the the shift with of uh, birum to bera yeah it's the same yeah it's the same wow. form so yeah ex exactly as you say you did, um the suggestion is that if this short e sound, whatever its quality was, was lengthening to e rather than e, then it must have been something whose quality is close to to e, and e is closer in quality to e. So that's why some people have suggested it it was actually bitela rather than bitela. Um, mm. And the same is true of the word wudu, which means wood, um, because that that seems to have come from Middle English ward, um, and you'd expect. Yeah, so if, if the U in Wudu had actually been U, then that's, as you say, that's closer to O. Um, so what, so what was the sequence there? It go, went from, um, so it started as a long U, and then a, I, I, I missed it. It started, I should specify these things because I'm not, very, not always very good at distinguishing them in my, my, when I speak, but Wudu has short U in um, the first syllable. Mm -hmm. um, and the suggestion is that that's, that was originally actually wudu, I suppose wudu or wudu, um, and then that became o because o is closer to o mm. than o is. You see what I mean? So it's as you say, it's the same thing. Is it so? Middle English is is ward. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, Middle English is ward. Ward, and then it gets reduced again to wood. Wood, which is pretty. Sorry. Except from, of course, I have my diphthongization. I say wood, but um, that's is that not is that derived from a, an o that came after Middle English, like wood? That's I've, I've now realised wood was a not a very good example because there's after the foot strut split, there's a whole kind of um, spider web where certain things end up with u and certain things end up with u and certain oh, things. Fascinating. Like so, the, I mean, there's some words like room, room, which different dialects take you know have different vowels for so would you say room or room i say room i say room uh roof um but i say hoof mm. and i do know people even around here in pennsylvania who say rough for roof oh, and okay. it, it sounds so just hilarious to me um i'd like to think i don't have any particular regionalisms People in Pennsylvania, depending on who you talk to, occasionally you can find some lovely regionalisms that are influenced sometimes by, say, Mennonites, um, uh, Amish, and things like that, uh, or other 
interesting peculiarities, uh, the reduction of day. I remember I had a teacher. He would say Wednesday instead of Wednesday or something like that. And I remember when I was in middle school or something, I thought, well, that's peculiar. Um, and uh, But those are, for the most part, I think, Pennsylvanians 50-50, you could find someone outside of the city, of course. The uh, Philadelphia accent is much like the New York accent in most respects. But if you find people of um, average education level, I think they would sound pretty much like general American. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you can find, of course, people of high education uh, levels in with a regional accent, obviously. I'm just trying to characterize what it's like here. But yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, please continue. Um, I room. Think I say room. room. Yeah, room. I've heard room. I don't know who says room, though. Oops. I, I say room um, in my accent, but I realize that's quite a different. It's, it's kind of in a different category of English accent. Um, I've got a friend who says uh, for, for pretty much all of those words. So tooth for tooth, roof mm. for roof. Um, that's lovely. And so on, which is interesting. It, I don't really know where he gets that. Well, I think his mum does it, but I don't know where she gets it from. Um, mm. Because that's not, I don't think that's common in southeastern England. Although I think it's, I think it's common in Wales. Um, relatively common because I had, well, I think this independently of having one Welsh friend that does it, but I have, I have a Welsh friend that does it. But I, yeah, I've heard it on television programs and things like that as well. Um, but yeah, that that whole thing. There's, I think Roger last did a, um, a tried to unpick the whole spider web of how certain things became who and certain things became uh mm. in um i think it was the cambridge history of english volume three uh, but mm. i can't i can't remember what the rules were i think there were some conditioning factors and maybe it was it was one of those situations where a sound change happens most of the way but doesn't affect all eligible words so then you end up with weird phonemic sp sp splits and stuff like that mm. um, well those happen like uh I was just thinking of a, a probably famous example would be, why does Italian have bene as Latin has bene, but it's, but say it's, it's bien French and bien in Spanish. Mm -hmm. Why, um, um, why is there no vowel breaking there? Portuguese doesn't usually have at least orthographic vowel breaking, like it's bang, but they have all sorts of adorable diphthongizations of everything here and there mm -hmm. in order to make their language as, as cute and adorable as possible. Oh, I like the idea of a room full of people sitting there with quills, like, how do we, what do we do to this sound to make it cuter? That's, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I've, I've joked that just because I like the sound of Portuguese a lot, and it's, it sounds, uh, um, having studied the other Romance languages first, mm. it just sounds really cute. So there's a lot of nasalization uh, in it, which makes it um, much more than French. The French uh, has a very different kind of nasalization pattern. So it's, uh, anyway. Oh, right. that was in interesting. Yeah, I don't know much about Portuguese other than that it's, I always think it's Slavic, which I think a lot of other people um, also also say, just because, I don't know. It's a Villarreal. Villarreal. Villa. Is, yeah, but then American English Villa. has quite a Villarreal as well, isn't it? In yeah. most positions. I don't know if it's more, more Villarized in certain positions rather than others, because... That's yeah. a good question. Um, I'm pretty sure the velarization is consistent for most positions, both European and Brazilian Portuguese, but I'd have to look at that. Okay. Uh, I'm sure someone will have a comment on it. But yeah, a pretty, I just, um, I would say it's, the velarization is stronger than what I do in my, because um, as a, a, an American um, uh, speaker of English, I, of course, velarize both initial and final and medial L pretty regularly. So I say both light and fall, but um, my interpretation is that in general, the contrast is much greater for uh, most British English speakers. Is that right? Whereas the like, uh, like uh, light, la is quite clear, whereas full, full, it's very, very velar. Is that that's accurate? Good. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I think at least Southern, well, I think it's spreading now, but at least Southern British, British English speakers, it's la. Um, syllable initially in all uh, well maybe not that leaderized but something like that syllable fine yeah but it's it's hard to tell when that originated because throughout the history of English there are if if l is velarized syllable finally it's prone to vocalization which is what's happened in languages like Polish um, and Dutch as well I think 
and yeah. the work becomes a vowel. So I think in work, yeah, work, yeah. It's like uh, my name in Polish, Luke in Polish is uh, Wukash. Really? Yeah, and that great Wukash. That the L with the cross thing through it. Yeah, <laughs> I like that. Me um, too. Whereas Russian, like other Slavic languages, has retained that beautiful la in a lot of positions, but they also have the um, a palatalized yeah yeah like um like uh, yet which is years yet oh, sorry yet not yet there's a there's special times where the e will close it has to be followed by a palatalized consonant so like this which means here is e but yet even though it's there's a palatalized l beforehand mm. it ends with an unpalatalized t so it's yet i think russian speakers correct me because i don't remember <laughs> yeah but I've heard of all kinds of things about vowel reductions, and I, I feel like the vowels have quite wide allophonic ranges, but I'm not sure if that's actually true. Uh, maybe. In, oh, in Russian? In Russian. Do you, do you oh, it's insane. It's wonderful. It's just like um, you get the, yeah, you go from something nice and orderly, East, uh, Western Slavic, I don't know, say uh, Czech. That's like your French garden. And then you get to Russian, that's like a nice, beautiful English garden. Beautiful, just flowers everywhere, chaos, vines, it's beautiful. I do, I, I'm a fan of it, but I, whenever I try and pronounce palatalized consonants, I'm always just like, I would have to commit so much time to trying to learn to pronounce these consistently, I've, like in normal speech. I, I, yeah. uh, I do them wrong all the time myself, and I, uh, it took me years just to get some kind of sense of intuition and I which I don't even really think I have so I hear you I'm sure you do but I, uh, as, as somebody who's admitted to having problems with it I can't actually say definitively <laughs> mm. other fun things too like uh, I learned later there's I think it's called easypronunciation.com or something okay. and uh, it gives I precise like narrow IPA transcriptions of Russian and other languages like say, mm. I think French and English um, and which was fascinating to see that, say the word I know, which is spelled znayu, znayu. Well, it has an ah, so I think, well, it's ah. So I was saying znayu. Mm. But and I always, it always sounded kind of funny how Russians are actually were saying it. They were saying something different than what I was doing. And I didn't realize what it was. But then I saw the transcription. It was with a, ah, like with ash. Like, oh, okay. It was znayu. So it's znayu. Mm. It's, not, it's a more znayu. And also Ya, yeah, meaning I is actually more like ya. Yeah. Mm. So yeah, so yes, so, yeah, znayu, And so they're both more a ah, or closer to a ah, than they are to, to a ah, or something more um more like that. And uh, I don't think I'm doing them correctly at the moment, but realizing that was like, whoa, why is that happening? It's because it's followed up by a palatalized um consonant or vowel, which is u sound, mm. which is causing it a raising effect. And it's like, oh man, that's so neat. So Russians. <laughs> Russian's a thicket. I like that. That, that, that <laughs> would be fun to study. It'd be fun to see where that goes in sort of 500-ish years, whether whether that leads to phonemic splits or anything like that. Um, yeah. But yeah. Mm. Um, I, so with, I, well, please, go ahead. I, I was just going to say I haven't actually introduced you yet, but I realise I can maybe put a slide at the start introducing you. Um, but, but yeah, this is Luke Ranieri. Um, who, who I've admired for quite a long time because you, I, I think I told you over WhatsApp, you did that video, um, I think it was on David Crystal's um, analysis of Elizabethan pronunciation. And I think that was a really long time ago, wasn't it? Oh, gosh, yes. And I, I find my, although my knowledge has barely increased in that time, I still find it a very, um, uh, a, a video which is so shallow in comparison to the wonderful work uh, you've done, for which reason, of course, I've admired uh, you as well for such a, a long time and uh, and your videos. So, but I think that video was probably instrumental in persuading me to sort of look 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 at that particular because because I'd always been interested in dialects, but really? the idea that you could sort of delve into the IPA of um, English spoken hundreds of years ago. So I think that that video probably was one of the things that that made me actually look at different analyses and stuff like that. So thank you very much for that. Oh gosh, well I'm I'm delighted. Uh, I'm really happy to hear that because I've um, I love it. I haven't practiced trying even to recite in um, 
some version of the reconstructed original pronunciation of Shakespeare in years. Uh, once in a while I do, and it just comes out as half Irish and half American, which is kind of what it is, but maybe yeah. not accurately. <laughs> Yes, um, all for a muse of fire, that kind of stuff, which is basically just his son, uh, uh, Ben, uh, Ben Crystal's rendition, but, which is interesting too, because I think you were, um, cause your reconstructions are the most precise things I've, I've seen on this topic. And, um, I'm not trying to flat, flatter you. It's just like really, really impressive. And one thing in particular that I've seen more research on is that trilled R was, like we're not like if Shakespearean pronunciation should probably have that at least initially. I don't. What are your thoughts on that? I, I think so. I'll start off by saying I think Alex Foreman, A. Z. Foreman's um, reconstructions are, were, are better than mine. I think he's, he does a very, very, very good job of. He is crazy idea. good. Like whatever he does. Like speaking of Latin, he, for example, he doesn't agree with uh, me and, uh, about the lax vowels in Latin, which is fine. He's also partially, I think, uh, because he knows Arabic really well. And that's something that is normal in Arabic, which also has phonemic vowel length. So for him, it seems very natural. Um, and he also velarizes L in all positions in Latin, not, including initially, very deliberately. And he has a kind of um, almost insane precision in everything he does. That's like, I could never do it like that. I could do it like the consistency. It's amazing. It's amazing what it does. So even, so I wanted just to, to say that even if I, because he, he may see this, and if he does, um, like I've always said to him, I adore and deeply admire everything he does even if we disagree on a latin reconstruction pronunciation he does it so well to, uh without any trace of native accent um thing, that i can I mean, tell it's, it's, it's really, crazy like, impressive so i've known yeah. about his videos for a, at least a year and it's only in the last kind of couple of months that i've realized what his actual accent is because i've never been able to tell until he's actually spoken in it i think there's one video where he does um i i, I could be wrong about it at, anyway but there's one video where he um i think it's like progressing uh copy pasta as if all sound changes were regular and there were no exceptions to them so there's a load of words just come out sounding slightly weird wow i haven't um, seen that one yeah he sounds like he's speaking some dialect of american english but until then i didn't realize because like, like everything he does as you say there's no no trace of a native accent and i've never actually I, talked to him so yeah, i'm yeah. fairly sure he's american but i've ne i've never heard i've just i've mostly seen his uh words written when he's mm -hmm. commenting and he's not uh, reciting something so yeah i've never i never heard him either well then we're, i'm sure he's if, if he is watching this and <laughs> He can retain his his mysteries if he wants. <laughs> but he's one of the most inscrutable fellows I've ever uh, um, encountered in this in this field, which is uh, is delightful. Yeah, I'm very. He's, he's got a good blog as well, which I'll link in the description. Um, mm. Where one of his one of his blog entries was on Crystal's reconstruction and some issues he has with it, which is it was very interesting to go through. But but as you say, like the trill, whether the R was trilled or not. Um, and so there are there are a few comments that suggest that sort of in the late 15, 1600s, it was weakening in, in, in the syllable coda, but we don't really know what weakening means um, because the way people use terminology around linguistics has changed so much. Um, mm. I think Robert Robinson, who was writing the early 1600s, used the word diphthongs when he, he meant di maybe i'm wrong maybe i'm thinking of the wrong person but some of those meant digraph meant digraph yeah that's how it's used consistently in ancient uh say latin and ancient greek too okay maybe maybe that's just yeah maybe that's us yeah. being weird rather than him being but but yeah the, the point being if you, if you were to read it with modern linguists uh, a link modern linguist's eye you'd mm. misinterpret some some words so i don't know what weaker means in that um, situation. I don't know if it means that it's turned into an approximant in the syllable coda, so it's er after vowels, or if it means that it's gone, but that because speakers of non-rhotic dialects today, many of my friends who speak as non-rhotically as I do will insist that there's a, an R at the end of the word car, um, or in the word nurse, when if you if you look at it on a, on a spectrogram, it's just um it's the vowel yeah it's just the vowel um, yeah 
I suppose because the R is necessary to create that vowel sound, right? There's no way to, to have a uh, caw without an R, right? It w because of like a bird would, would call, caw. That's true. In American mm -hmm. English, right? So it requires the R to create the vowel. I, I'm guessing, I, I, right? Is that right? Well, there might be loan words without it, but the thing is it's, it's treated as, because you, do you know about the linking R thing? I was, I was about to ask, the linking R, it would re retain it, would it not? Yeah, so the linking R, um, it's retained in situations where there's, yeah, like you say, there's, there, there was originally a rough at the end of a word and then the next word starts with a vowel. Mm, like and liaison in French, a memory of the oh, sound. Okay. Yeah. Like yeah, um, new, petit yeah. ami, what? Uh, petit ami, which would be um, boyfriend. It could also be, could be girlfriend. Um, but yeah, petit, which is small, and then it's followed by ami, so petit ami. Oh, so there's a t, which wouldn't normally yes. be pronounced, I see. Okay. Yes, the t, it's, which is really fascinating. Um, I think that the liaison, uh, it's this memory of something that, if you take a word in isolation, it's lost. Yeah. Italian has something like that too. Uh, it's called uh, raddoppiamento phonosyntactico, um, phonosyntactic redoublement. <laughs> like, like, like the gum, redoublement yeah. gum, uh, and it's uh, where I say a preposition like a ah, will geminate in standard Italian. There are, there are dialects that don't do this. Say um, a Milano means in Milan, and a ah means at or in. So a Milano, um, you have a double M sound, a Milano, mm. um, or it's to you, a te, a te, a te. Um, and a Milano is a funny way to remember that too, because the Milanese dialect usually doesn't do that. So if someone says a Milano instead of a Milano, oh, they're probably from Milan or oh, further from yeah. the north, potentially, um, depending on their dialect. And uh, so that's why is that happening? Because it was ad in Latin. So it's ad Milano or something, ad whatever, uh, ad te, ad te. So the, um, the yeah, memory yeah. of something that's otherwise completely gone. Yeah. is still there and long vowels uh too like um tra which comes from intra which it means between in italian tra so tra poco means soon means between a little literally so between a little soon and it's not tra poco or it can be in milanese uh accent but it's tra poco tra poco so why because intra has a long vowel in latin and the long vowel has a reverse compensatory lengthening of the consonant instead of the vowel. That's really strange. Isn't that bizarre? And it's retained yeah. to the modern day, thousands of years later. Certainly um, more than a thousand years since the loss of phonemic vowel length. Hmm. And yet the, uh, uh, the syllable length is retained. It's just, just really, striking. I've never heard, that's, that's really interesting. I like when I hear about new sound changes that, well, not new, obviously, but new to me sound changes. Mm -hmm. Um, and also, like you say, about things which are conservative, but in a, in a really strange way, like they or things that have managed to hold on either in really restricted phonological environments or in one dialect where all other dialects have lost it or something and somehow aerial mm. effects haven't destroyed, you know, yeah, mm. it's, it's, I'm trying to think of examples from English where that, that kind of thing has happened, where it retains something, um, I suppose there are um, phrases that kind of fossilized and things like that, but. What, what's a phrase that we use with say a uh, car? So like uh, car, car under, I don't know. I, I can't, can you oh, think yeah. of something, a normal sounding English sentence with that <laughs> or a different word with R? The car in the street. The car in the, okay. The car in the street. Oh, that was, yeah, yeah that's good. So, so uh, car in, I, what, what I was thinking about was I know there's a video from the 70s, which is an interview with a hundred some year old woman who grew up in the uh, late. Um, is it Florence? I, don't know. I believe so. She was well dressed and she spoke with the trilled R. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think it was actually Alex Foreman who pointed that out, the video out to me. Or maybe it was Rafael Torrigiano. I don't remember. But um, it's, uh, it's, so with that, I, what I wonder is, was she doing the same linking R? And was the linking R trilled or was it um, R? How would you describe R? I don't know how to call that. And I know the IPA uh, symbol, but I don't know. What it is. Approximate. And I'll be able to approximate. There you go. <laughs> so how, I don't know if, if you noticed if someone with I'm an older accent sure. had a R 
how would they link it? My my granddad uh, taps his bars in certain situations. Um, mm, like Patrick Stewart. Kind, yeah, kind of. He's from the northwest, um, where it's more more normal to do that if you're if you're old. Um, so he, I've I've actually thought about this quite a lot. So it, if it's in a syllable coda, but it's inside of a word, it's not at the end of a word. He won't pronounce it. So in the word nurse, it would never surface at all. Um, in the sentence, the car in the street, he would probably say, Karin, Karin, Karin. with a tap. Yeah. Um, but I also think he doesn't, in, in, in the way that Southeastern English speakers would, would expand that linking R to all instances of non-high vowels at the ends of words, even if they didn't historically have R in them. Um, hmm. he, he doesn't do that. So uh, if I, he pointed this out to me once, I said, I saw it as in past tense of C, like I saw it, but mm -hmm. with the intrusive, what, what used to be called the intrusive R there. And he, um, we've been talking about pronunciation and stuff. And he sort of pointed out, oh, well, I wouldn't say the, I wouldn't say R in that sentence. He'd just say, I saw, I saw it, which I, I saw it. Like most American English sort of, would say it. Exactly. I saw it. Yeah. The, the linking R, um, to uh, an American ear is, uh, sounds very British or very characteristic of certain British voices. Yeah, I saw it. Sound, yeah. I've yeah. heard pe people have pointed it out in, my, in, the, in the comments and I wonder if it's something people notice much in normal um, conversations with British people. The fact that you do or don't uh, do it? The, the fact that I do do it. You say saw it. Saw it, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. Sounds very lovely normal british way of speaking i'm so. glad it doesn't sound horrific but yeah no no it's it's uh not at all um of course you're talking to someone who loves pretty much every accent and dialect of mm. uh, whatever language that's that's been around so um um but uh but yeah no I, I i love that i think it's so interesting now did that develop um through analogy with a true etymological r like in <laughs> um for it I think it sort of must have done. Um, I'm I'm not sure about the exact mechanics of it, but if because it, it must have developed, it, people were commenting on it in the sort of 19th century. I think it must have developed at a time when at least a large-ish number of people weren't completely literate, um, and at first it's derided as a working class thing. So I think it might be one of those things like. There's a similar thing in, in uh, Victorian literature where people, particularly Cockney speakers, but also I think certain Northern speakers will hypercorrectively add her to the beginning of a word that starts with a vowel because they know- As dropping, you can see and even in uh, Imperial Latin. What, it, the, the hypercorrection thing? With an H, oh yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Is that because it was, because I there's, what's that? There's that one text where there's just a load of corrections, isn't there? Like you should. Oh yes, the um, index probi, uh, at, which is fascinating. I wish we knew exactly what year it was made, because yeah, it corrects. Um, one of my favorites too, which I used as a way to give authority to the pronunciation system I uh, devised with Raphael Torrijano for ancient Greek, right. is that in uh, the uh, it's probably late second century but if i'm not mistaken the document but he says an amphora with an f not ambora mm. the amphora because it's a p it's a ph sound mm. now and which is could mean all kinds of things to me what it seems to to mean is that at least by that time period common ancient greek and therefore the high quality latin which was trying to sound just like we have so many french words from english and then classy people will try to pronounce words that were imported from French a long time ago before they sounded like modern French as modern French to sound more correct, right. which is an, a natural impulse because the idea that French pronunciation could have been radically different in the past doesn't occur to most yeah. people. Uh, so anyway, yeah, it's, it was, um, so the ancient Greek sound etymologically was an aspirated pa, yeah. ampora, um, ampora, in fact, it checks, ampora, 
when that changes to first a bilabial fa and then later labial dental fa is not certain. But what the appendix probi tell, uh, tells me is that <clears throat> at the very least that um, we have something approaching a fricative which justifies at least a bilabial fa in late uh, Roman classical times as a pronunciation for Greek, which is so much easier to understand for most people. Because when I've kind of complained about this, I once complained that people aren't doing the aspirated consonants when they speak ancient Greek or when they recite ancient Greek. Mm -hmm. And they should because, hey, it's right here. It's in a book. Do it, do it, darn it. And then people started doing it. And I regretted it <laughs> immediately because I couldn't understand what anyone was doing, not because they were doing it right, but because they were doing it horribly wrong and that's not their fault because most classics people are just not training linguistics i mean i'm barely trained myself and i'm, I'm not a, obviously a professional linguist at all um uh, and so they would very inc and so i found even as much as i love doing this i was so i would with, do it with great difficulty and people who would casually try to do it say they're native english speakers for example they would um do it they would just initially whether it's a, a kappa or a chi it would just be aspirated and if it was word internal and a, they wouldn't all they did was create a merger of all three ka, so katapa and katapa as the same three phonies right. with allophonic differences exactly like english which made it completely incomprehensible so they, did they just take the aspiration thing and think, oh, well, English has aspirations, so I suppose I'll just do what I do in English kind of thing? I think they were really trying, but without the having, like, because it's it's probably, I think that's the, like, have you studied Indian, Indian languages, like Sanskrit or Hindi, with that kind of, no, no. like, bah, you know, those kinds of, that those are super question. hard to get used to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can never, because those, I think there's some suggestion that those were the aspirated voiced Explosives, obviously aspirated voices, it can't work the same way as uh, voiceless aspirates because the, the whole thing is that there's a voicing onset delay. So, yeah, I think that's how, how they're sometimes reconstructed in Proto Indo European as pretty voiced. Um, okay. Yeah. And, and Greek retained the three way contrast, and then, um, which is lost in other Indo European languages. Yeah, really, really weird. And um, anyway, so I immediately regretted it uh, because uh, obviously I, I get to interact with this uh, community of Latin and ancient Greek speakers and ancient Greek has so many, so many problems, so many things against it. Um, you have, <laughs> when it comes to pronunciation, oh no, and just in general, just uh, pedagogy. Um, I've created a few videos, which I need to continue for teaching ancient Greek and some other materials, but just pretty much everything out there um, including my, my video series, which is just the beginning, it's just not enough, or it's not uh, in, uh, in depth enough, or it's not comprehensible input based enough to actually master the language. So the whole pedagogy, I don't know if you see my, saw my gotcha Greek video where I made fun of the learning of ancient Greek. Yes. Um, uh, it's basically, I totally tongue in cheek, make fun of the whole language and the study of it and how terrible it can be, which is highly exaggerated, but uh, was a lot of fun to make. So that has so many things against it. When it comes to pronunciation too, you have modern Greeks who write papers to this day professing that the pronunciation of the ancient language is identical to the modern language. And these really? are like real linguists oh, really? in Greece. Yes. Really? I'd love to show you one of the papers. I think see if I can find it while we're, while we're chatting. I could, I could send it to you later. That's, um, that's and, and they're serious. Yeah. And, it be, and they regard a lot of the reconstructions as a kind of... Um, barbarous stealing of um of stolen valor there's another term for that uh stolen valor is sort of like a military thing where if you wear a, a military uniform here <laughs> that would be stolen valor. what's the term i'm looking for cultural appropriation that's what the, uh, modern greeks seem to think about the ancient language despite the fact that of course greek hellenistically was spoken through so many countries and so many cultures mm -hmm. for thousands of years um that uh that it's not only like Latin, in my opinion, ancient Greek is not only the cultural property of the Greeks. Right. That is how I see it. And I think um, most people probably are fine seeing it that way. Just like English is hardly the property of, of um, native English speakers anymore. Yeah. That's how it is. Yeah. Uh, as you yeah. say, I mean, English is spoken in so many places. There are so many, there are native dialects of English now that have massive substrates from other languages, like various dialects of Indian English, where people are native speakers, but 
will often be mistaken for non-native speakers by other native English speakers because it's mm. yeah, because there's such a strong substrate from another, another language. Right. Um, stuff like and it must have been I, I imagine it must have been the same with Greek. Uh, there must have been oh yeah a variety on on substrates that were sort of more local mm. languages. Oh, there's a, a wonderful uh, fellow. Who, his name is Ben Cantor, and his uh, YouTube channel, which is criminally undersubscribed, um, Koine Greek, uh, Koine Greek .com, and he is doing some of the like he's writing the the book or books now, doing the research in exactly this. It's because it, he um, is particularly interested in reconstructions of um, uh, of Greek uh, as spoken in in Palestine. Okay. and as well as egypt of course but um it's a little bit harder since there's just so much testimony of papyri 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 babudi papyri sounds terrible in english I don't, papyrus is fine papyrus is, is hurts my declension sensibilities <laughs> parchment uh <laughs> in the wonderful dry egyptian desert and there's plenty of stuff in palestine but not nearly as much anyway he's reconstructed a lot of like incredible precision about the substrate. How does that influence that? And um, as a scholar of biblical texts, that's very interesting because quite a lot of people are very interested in learning ancient Greek, specifically the Koine dialect, because biblical Greek is written in that. And so they want to reconstruct the sound of it because they want to immerse themselves in that kind of soundscape, which uh, is wonderful. And I admire and I it support. Is, and that's, yeah. Um, and um, so, yeah, substrate or the Coptic substrate in the uh, egyptian greek that's mm, um, yeah because they didn't have oh, excuse excuse me did, did you almost say that in italian schools i mean yes i did <laughs> um, but yeah i i was gonna you're in really right four days out of italy and i still can't speak english oh, normally you, you in the u.s <laughs> yeah i, I came oh, back for uh, for christmas i'm going back in a week is it a really I, I, I was under the impression it was vaguely the same time. If I, if I caught you at a horrible time. Oh, before. hardly, my friend. I've been up since 2 a.m. Oh, uh, uh, because I have, I've done this, this trip back and forth uh, two or three times this year, uh, maybe four, and I've consistently kept the Italy time zone. Oh, really? Uh, uh, which is great because I don't have to experience jet lag. And then I get to work in the mornings and I just go to bed when the sun goes down and it's fine. <laughs> Fair enough. As long as it, yeah, as long as I haven't woken you up, some uh, horrible. No, that, no, that, no. That means you've actually been awake longer than uh, you would otherwise have been awake, which is probably, yeah, probably a good thing. Oh, it's, no, this is ideal. Ideal time for me. It's basically the same. It's just not as much illumination from the exterior of the, the building um, <laughs> as it would have been in, in Rome. Uh, but otherwise, the same for me. Yeah. So, uh, what was it? Sorry, I, I schools at me. Or is, or is I, I was just going to say I was I was thinking exactly of Palestine when I said the substrate mm -hmm. thing. I was thinking, oh, wouldn't it be interesting to sort of be able to hear the, the kind of Greek that the Bible um, has got in it? Um, mm, let's connect to you with Ben Cantor, maybe, because he's that's his specialty. He knows all. He knows that in such tremendous detail. Um, I um, in the way at some point, that, yeah. Yeah, which is very interesting to me. I ended up being becoming so frustrated. There's a wonderful book, um, a nice, you know, cool 800 pager uh, by uh, by Horrocks. I didn't actually finish it because the, the the last part about Byzantine Greek and modern Greek and I is the whole history of the Greek language from um, Mycenaean, even some Minoan stuff, Linear B to the modern thing. It's a beast, but it's tremendous. And um, that was really helpful in my uh, study of, because I'm, I am really interested in, in reconstructing and understanding really specific changes and, uh, diastratic changes. Um, and, uh, and, uh, oh gosh, I forgot all, I was just reading these earlier and I can't remember them. The, the terms for the diet, diageography, what's the word called? Diatopic. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> diageography. Diag <laughs> to be honest, I, 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 I wouldn't have been able to pull diatopic out of my head. I was just reading it. I, just didn't, I should have remembered it. But um, so um, I'm really interested in knowing that. But what I found, too, is playing with like Alex Foreman does uh, and as you do with such tremendous um, uh, aplomb and accuracy, reconstructing specific accents of certain time periods. I found that while I'm fascinated by that, <clears throat> 
it there's there's a pedagogical thing which ends up coming in if we want to you know this is what why this is so useful even mm -hmm. if there are a couple mistakes in my opinion to pronunciation um it gives a clear guide of how to pronounce latin in essentially a, something close to at least approaching the classical pronunciation if not exactly um and ditto for ancient greek what do you do because the classical greek pronunciation of the fifth century bc is not radically but sufficiently different from that during the ancient roman classical period that is also the time that the bible is written in which interests a lot of people uh the koine greek and so forth what do you do when you have a language whose literature spans 800 years mm. and it's basically the same language yeah there are of course differences that there are in any literary language over hundreds of years difference between jane austen charles dickens shakespeare uh stephen king um are there but it's still the same language it's kind of like that like would we actually do we need to teach non-native speakers of english multiple different pronunciation systems jane austen's era charles dickens era modern era and then you have geographical differences we have obviously north american and british english but there's also irish scottish new zealand indian yeah. australian Somehow. you know there's all these these <laughs> varieties do we um do, every time we change an author do we pronounce it differently and we have the same problem in antiquity except it's way worse i think because we have native speakers who speak in a certain way and one can liberally as a non-native speaker choose any of these accents to imitate and they're all correct they're all normal they're all standard and or even if they're not standard they're still real when and we have way more variety in the ancient past way less evidence to um clearly define it though we can get close enough and if you so what do you do um so my resolution my frust my kind of threw up my hands and said okay let's just pick stuff that's in the middle and that's what Raphael Torrijano and I did and we came up with this Lucian pronunciation which is essentially um basically in between most of the sound shifts and is uh contemporaneous with the Roman classical period yeah, I don't envy you having to having to pick all of that apart because that's I, I mean I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you've done it but um yeah it sounds like I mostly just gave up I didn't you know to envy me I was just <laughs> like well no so <laughs> I'll okay. let Ben, ben Cantor and the other the rest figure out the Greek problems um but we need to be able to communicate in an effective way so True. communicate in ancient greek um, yeah yeah which is hard because it's it's so poorly um it's in generally in generally oh my gosh in generale i don't know why i made that so in no, general nice to, it would be nice to go over this and sort of look at whether there's an italian substrate developing in your <laughs> It's a super straight. Super straight. It's yeah. it's uh it's in it's a it's a hyper straight, <laughs> hyper strato. <laughs> yeah, it's um. What's well, this actually fun? Because normally I have this problem when I speak Italian, as I have Latinisms, which over the past seven months have. I was gonna say pian piano, little by little, have been. I was on. I was just doing a a, a live stream yesterday on um, uh, a new channel called the Liga Romanica. With a couple of uh, YouTubers you might know, Davide Gemello, and um, yeah, I think I do. And uh, okay, yeah, they're they're great. If you have any interest in Portuguese, French, Italian, or or Spanish, yes, they're oh, they've all the tr tremendous channels. Anyway, and I was invited as a guest there, and I was speaking Italian most of the time because they don't speak English. They only they each speak their native languages, kind of like eco linguists. Oh, yeah. But they all understand each other, and it's really interesting. Yeah. And so I was speaking Latin, so I've already um, uh, totally confused my brain today which is now italian latinized <laughs> yeah that must because i at one point was trying to learn old english and german concurrently which isn't as much because people advised me because i said to a friend oh i'm going to try and learn dutch and they said don't don't try and learn dutch while you're trying to learn german or you'll mix things up um i i haven't really had that problem with old english um and german beyond occasionally I think when I'm in German mode, that there's a couple of old English words that I, I will sometimes slip in. But the thing is, the phonologies are different enough that they kind of form separate categories in my head. But I don't know if it's given that the vowel systems, even if the vowels don't pattern in the same way, given the vowel systems are, I think, very, very similar between Italian and Latin. Um, or does it? Does Italian have more? It has more vowels, doesn't it? it has air and or, does it? 
It, it has a, a seven vowel quality system and Latin has a 10 vowel quantity system. Right, okay. Um, sure. So, so yeah, I found, um, actually I've had this problem this year uh, because since I started uh, living in Italy regularly this, this past year, mm. um, it was fun to realize how much I allowed my Italian to deteriorate after not studying it hardly at all for many years. And since I spent so much time in Latin to see how much Latin would just come out. And another thing, vowel system and quality wise is that since um, I reconstruct uh, Latin with only five vowel qualities, um, meaning I do try to do a true mid e and and o, e and o. And I'll try to distinguish e and a, o, o as Italian does or Portuguese, French and other Romance languages will do. Um, I deliver, and I used to, and then I tried to undo it for years, which I succeeded. So then when I was speaking Latin until this year, I would consistently do these more central sounding, more like Spanish, more like modern Greek, uh, these true mid vowels, which only have five vowel qualities, right? Yeah, um, but then my Italian was suffering all the time because every unstressed letter E and letter O, E and O are always closed mm. in Italian. And that's where the unstressed vowels, where most of the vowels are. So most of the, my vowels were sounding too open to the Italian year. They, they, the Italians would say they sounded open, which isn't technically correct. They were relatively more open, but they weren't as open as, say, o and a. Yeah. They were o and e instead of o and e, which is what they'd have to be when they're in an unstressed position. So I realized, oh my gosh, um, I have to really. So now, so that's caused a huge amount of confusion for me. Uh, probably someone to say, a, someone comfortable with Spanish trying to learn Italian would have to have to retune that. So now I've been retuning that in uh, in my Italian. So yeah, there's a huge amount of um, annoying things to deal with. <laughs> yeah, I was imagining it with just a, a, a five vowel system, and then I remembered I'd seen like charts comparing Spanish and Italian, um, the Spanish and Italian vowel systems. Because as you say, when I when I um, was exposed to a lot of Spanish in my first year at university. I did. I noticed how, how, because I'd been taught obviously the IPA characters e o, uh, e u e o, um, and I yeah I was struck by how low um, or how open the e and o are for at least a lot of Castilian Spanish speakers. They are genuinely in the middle really aren't they they kind of well they, they can be halfway pretty much halfway between the a ipa character and the air ipa character for some... they could be anywhere on that spectrum yeah yeah and i think generally they tend to be neither um but they, there's there are regional differences um positional differences but they're generally allophonic they're not they're certainly not phonemic it'd be interesting to to actually this is something i'm trying to do for english and german at the moment is um look at the allophonic ranges of certain vowels um, by sort of doing a formant analysis on them um, and seeing whether they overlap much when you take into account um, phonological environment and stuff like that. It'd be interesting to do the mm -hmm. same thing with like Spanish that has a relatively small vowel system, um, vowel inventory, and see how big the allophonic ranges can get. Um, mm -hmm. And actually now I, now I say that, I'm curious, um, from our conversation earlier, I wonder whether e, like in the English word kit, would, would be heard as e to a, like a Spanish speaker, whether it would be heard what, as... What English word? Like e as in kit or sit. Yeah, that's an interesting question, uh, because um, as, uh, as I'm sure you're aware, between, say, uh, between American, uh, British, uh, English, and German, hmm. those are, are a little bit different. Yeah. to realize the lax vowel uh i think german's a little bit more um stretto is the word i'm looking for a little bit tighter yeah uh, uh in german is my impression i think it's also tighter in many british accents where it tends to be lax laxist in american english uh would, would you agree like when i say in him kit in yeah i think i think i think yours is slightly laxer mm. uh, than mine, yeah. I think German, like Germans in, uns, in, in unstressed positions are in words that are not completely stressed. I think I've heard them pronounce that vowel quite lax 
Um, but mm. I think, that, yeah, I'm, I'm not actually sure that's how. Interesting. If it's unstressed, that's different. But it's definitely like, not. Uh, it's definitely not the same as my ear quality. Yeah. Levels. Yeah. yeah um, in the house, in, 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 in the house. I've heard people say like in, or well, maybe not. Uh, yeah, in the house. But like. Uh. Um, yeah, I don't. I've, I've uh, barely studied ger German since high school. <clears throat> that is, I haven't since high school, so, so I don't remember. I remember kind of thinking about that at the time, but I'd have to um, listen to a broader range of examples. And um, I think about Kenneth Branagh. He usually sounds <clears throat> his is sounds a little bit more American, but he's also Irish, right? Yeah, I think I, I've heard Irish speakers. Well, Irish English speakers pronounce them very really lax. Um, I've heard speakers from well it's scottish english the the most common pronunciations seem to be really lax like central sl slightly to the front of kind of center almost schwa um, really like, like what i'm not going to be able to do it now like ket 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 maybe I, i'm not doing it very well but it's i always heard it as this like air but I think it is much more central than that, but it's, mm. it's really strange. Um, but then yeah. you go to Northern England and you find pronunciations that are just eh, but, but tenser, like eh, almost, almost eh, e, but not. Tenser, that's what I was like, not tighter, tenser. Yeah, <laughs> Thank yeah. you, tenser and laxer, got it. Uh, you remember the Italian word, but you can remember the, um, the English word. Cavolo, <laughs> what the heck? Anyway, uh, <laughs> so uh, yes, yeah, so the tensor. So the uh, yeah, that's interesting. Mm. But yeah, I, 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 I was thinking about the um, the um, the monolingual fieldwork thing, and I'm trying to work out how I'd even do it because because the thing is the way Dan Everett did it in the video I was basing that on. Uh, he had a speech so some somebody sourced a speaker for him who i who spoke english as a i think a second language but spoke this other language as a first language and he had to speak piraha so that so that she wouldn't understand him so that they genuinely had no language in common um and i mm. I, I don't know whether i'm prepared enough to do that but with the the google translate thing i just kind of typed in sentences and stuff so i'm looking around for objects that yeah. Would you like to try doing that? Or do you think it would be, a, I don't want to. Oh, do I want to do that. Actually, I was w wanted to propose, maybe uh, we could do that. Uh, we do a little bit here, give the, your audience a taste. And maybe on, um, on my channel, we'll, um, we'll do a full, yeah. uh, nice, as long as we want, see how long it goes before it, it, it's, uh, it may be exhausting or maybe fun, mm -hmm. where you, of course, speak in English or whatever language you want. And uh, <laughs> Old English, if you like, and I'll speak in Latin and see how much we can understand each other. Yeah, that sounds fantastic. Yeah. Do you have it? I mean, speaking Old English is, is not something people do. I don't know if you have any kind of uh, comfort in doing that with uh, on a conversational basis beyond a few yeah. phrases I, you may have written in advance. I, if I am um, writing, I, I, I sort of have to script it. Um, I don't think I am comfortable talking it completely conversationally. There are, there are certain things that I could say happily but i think in in that situation i'd need to kind of prepare um could you but, write scripts of conversations in old english could i write scripts of conversations in old english yeah I think like lots of them say a conversational manual <laughs> are, you, are you proposing a a book <laughs> yes um, I a could. short perhaps a short one or or something for your patreon supporters to start with to to workshop it um so that sounds that's that it sounds very fun um i think i i would worry too much about making um silly mistakes because i think in if people are if people are paying for it then any mistake i make is kind of amplified <laughs> well, <laughs> you well, your wonderful patreon supporters i'm sure would love to um work 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 with you and and try it out and let and be of course accepting of your um, possible mistakes, hypothetical only at this point. And then uh, once you have something that you like, then um, I'm sure there's some other old English uh, experts who would be happy to take a look at it. And then, because I think that would be a real gift. The way I interact with languages, um, as far as learning them, is wanting to speak them. Mm -hmm. I always approach Latin wanting to speak it, which is weird. 
I just had that impulse because I didn't know there was another way to learn languages. I don't think that's weird at all. I think well, yeah, in the academic world, that's weird. Um, and uh, I would love, I would love an old Norse conversation one, an old English one, please and thank you. I'm, I'm sure. I, I'm sure. T take my money. <laughs> please, please, please write it. <laughs> there's, there's, there's a, a somebody I think we both know who would be better poised to write the old Norse one at least. Um, well, yes, yeah, so I'm thinking of him. Uh, yeah. If we can um, encourage him, if he's if he's up to it. But uh, but yeah, if I would, if you're yeah if you're interested in that, I think that would be so useful. Um, I know that a lot of because in my community of Latin ancient Greek speakers, we realized ah this is this is um, for people who are kind of recovering translation grammar method. Mm -hmm. um, Latin and ancient Greek studies. And they're trying to teach now or trying to learn inactive methods they now don't really want to approach language in the translation method. They can, but they realize, ah, oh, there's so much more if I can express myself, if I can look around the kitchen and um, talk about what I'm going to do yeah. or walk outside and describe things I see. Mm -hmm. um, so even if, uh, which, so it could be valuable, even if you don't have the ability to spontaneously speak fluently old English, you could create a whole group or generation of people who can. I, I think there's a um, good, what is it? There's a Discord server. Um, yes, there is. Discord, yeah, I, which is I haven't had have done for Discord in about a year. So I just That's totally fair. stopped. <laughs> but yeah, there is one there. And um, you okay. could definitely workshop it with them. And Well, I, I, I will, I'm sure, I'm sure there are people in that server who are much better um, equipped to write that kind of thing than I am. Although I, I'd be interested in doing like a, a kind of, I was thinking about, a dialect of the 19th century kind of going through the phonology bit by bit but, but i don't know wow. if that is accessible yeah. um yes please but, <laughs> well, thank you very much for your for your confidence oh well well from, deserved well earned for sure from, from somebody uh, who's such a good teacher yourself oh gosh well, that's very kind well so are you um but uh what i wanted to oh so the there is an there's the notion of the fear of teaching something wrong, right? That's the law of primacy. And it's especially keen it's to an extent languages, but especially kinesthetic learning. When I was in flight school, they were very keen on making sure we were putting our hands on the, the flight controls mm -hmm. in the right position and, and getting a kind of uh, almost like learning choreography, getting the right physical movements in a very, of course, conscious mechanical way so that they would become apparent. and you can just do it yeah because if you say say your grip the cyclic is the name of the um primary um directional control and um and uh the in a helicopter so if your hand is on on the cyclic and if you handle it like say an airplane uh yoke where it's um you move your hand a lot mm. on an airplane yoke you're doing a lot of little control movements that are pretty big depending on the airplane, it's, it's like, they're all different, but like little ones, you're moving your hand a lot, like little, like little, boop, boop, kind of just like an assess and just keeping yourself, um, like adjustment um, kind of thing. Yes. Constant, lots of constant adjustments, way more than a car. Um, but then with a helicopter, if you make movements that big, it uh, starts creating, um, oh, what's it called? Uh, pilot induced oscillations it where like you'll failing kind of thing. Yeah, where you'll start, it'll start to just like get away from you and you don't know what's going on. And then the instructor pilot just freezes your hand on top and just like, stop doing that. Yeah. And then the helicopter stabilizes. So you need, yeah, you need to, especially with helicopters that don't have certain stabilization mechanisms, you do have to, of course, keep your hand moving, but it's much more subtle the movement. And the anticipation and the delay that you have to do is uh is different than an airplane in any case the point is that you go through that choreography you don't re you start to starts to work for you you start to like hovering is the hardest thing in the world it takes like 20 hours to get um i can't imagine yeah yeah <laughs> to get it's great it's like oh i really hope we don't crash this thing it'd be so embarrassing if i die it'd be so embarrassing at least i'd be dead like you have those kinds of thoughts <laughs> at least i'd be dead <laughs> <laughs> and then and you go back and forth uh but then it starts to work for you and you don't know why but you have the the physical movement and then eventually you have the reciprocal oh this is working and then eventually the movements become unconscious so that's law of primacy right if you learned it wrong then you'd have to work a lot harder to eventually correct it or you'd constantly be doing an unnecessary movement that you would have to later correct yeah. it happens in languages too 
Um, plenty of examples I have. Like I, uh, I'm right now I'm taking a diction course in uh, for Italians who want to standardize their accent. Mm -hmm. But I'm the teacher's very good and is also willing to take a foreigner to to help my particular things, which are very different or sometimes quite different. Something I've found that I do, which I'm trying to correct, is I overcompensate with my closed vowels. Like with my uh, my e and uh, o, I was making them to e and to e and o. And the reason is because I wasn't um, broadening the width of my mouth enough. That's like, interesting. And like if you think of Italians, how they talk to you, like they're moving their mouth so much and it's this ridiculous stereotype. But I found, I, I don't even think I move my mouth enough to speak English with clear diction now that I've seen myself do it in 500 videos. Um, I think, I think you, I don't think that's true at all. I think it's, it's one of those things where I wouldn't have thought about the, I wouldn't have thought about how much you move your mouth as a factor in how your speech comes out, but I suppose mm. it is. Yeah. It's a huge part of the um, getting the right um, oral posture in Italian. Mm. And once I started doing that, I realized, oh, I don't need to force the E and the O into like E U territory. I was doing that because I wasn't able to get enough uh, distance, enough uh, breadth in the two sounds, and I was forcing it because I didn't have. I was overcompensating because I was doing something incorrectly. That's a law of primacy thing, um, but it is correctable. And I just mentioned all that to say that if you have the fear of publishing something with mistakes and you're afraid, of course, uh, being in the position of a teacher of teaching something wrong, I would advise you, don't worry about it. For one, there's nothing out there that's like it. So uh, the result would be you'd have people who end up learning some kind of basic A1, A2 fluency um, in the language with some mistakes. That would be far better than where they are now, like where I am, which is no old English at all. Mm -hmm. I'd rather learn your slightly teensy, be the little bit mistakes hypothetical, which we don't even know if they're there. Then nothing at all. There would definitely be mistakes. Yeah, <laughs> there'd be syntactic mistakes, definitely. Um, no, they could be corrected though. That's that's true. Yeah. Other teachers and other books, or your uh, corrections to books that you end up uh, producing. So I'm already, we're already like five years in the future now, uh, or hopefully maybe a year, a year, a book in a year <laughs> would would correct. So I said, don't have that kind of fear. Um, I uh, I understand that impulse, um, and it's also an impulse which usually which is especially true of all students of languages i think they're afraid to make mistakes i'm still like that in italian now that i'm especially hyper aware of my pronunciation and wanting to improve it i'm like what let's i'm like i don't even want to especially because when you wear the the uh the mask outside mm, it, yeah. you physically don't move your mouth as much yeah. and also if i i feel almost feel like i can maybe trick them if i only say like grazie and a couple words that they won't hear my foreign accent and I kind of like, I don't know why I'm, why would I be embarrassed? I don't know. But like everybody has that, even someone um, who's relatively confident in a, in a language. And there are teachers who have been, uh, I've had a students learning to speak Latin and they, they have to try to change their mentality because they're so, their whole, they're, and they want to, they want to change from, oh, I think about every single word and the translation and the syntax, as opposed to allowing themselves to flexibly try to speak the language in any kind of communicative way, they're yeah. hyper focused on the individual pieces for now, uh, but then eventually they'll be able to get past that and move move beyond that um, that uh, that focus. Yeah, of course they will. Yeah, I heard one of those. I suppose there's an extra dimension to it in Latin is the whole sort of I speak this language better when I'm drunk because I'm not worrying about you know. <laughs> it's always true. Well, yeah. It's, it's uh, generally very true. <laughs> it's yeah. It's just the the effect of not not worrying about people calling you an idiot. Well, obviously, people you like to think that the people you're interacting with aren't going to do that anyway. But but um, and also I, another thing that that bothers me is the the fact that even though I know if somebody came to the UK and spoke English with a thick sort of Italian accent or a, a German accent or whatever. The majority of people wouldn't take issue with them for doing so. I don't know if the same thing's true in other cultures. Do you know what I mean? I don't know. If oh that, yeah, you know, uh, accents. They have a completely different, yeah, reaction to to, to stereotype the stereotype. Um, I would say <laughs> that that uh, the that in general, I I have spent four days in 
uh, in England and I was training actors to speak Latin and, and they were English and it was a wonderful experience. So I haven't had that specific experience of seeing how um, Englishmen or Brits in general uh, deal with that situation. But I can know that Americans generally are, are like, um, if I were to use some kind of different American accent, they would hear like, like, oh, oh, uh, it is my, my, my first time in mm -hmm. Alabama, where is the, where is the, where is the bar, which they mean a uh, coffee shop. Mm -hmm. And they say, oh, well, you, uh, where, where, oh, well, it's right over there. Where are you from? And they're like, oh, just what a beautiful accent. I love you. They're, they're just so usually wherever they're from. And I was sort of a stereotypical Southern kind of accent mm -hmm. are super uh, excited to hear a foreign accent, especially because with our um, uh, lack of proximity to mm -hmm. other foreign languages and countries, just one other reason Americans seldom learn um languages a bit of water will will, will do that i think um, um we're we generally appreciate most kinds of of uh of foreign accents especially in that kind of situation and i understand that france is the exact opposite of that um <laughs> i have heard things to that effect i have I heard too. Encountered, I, encountered. I learned french in geneva or i studied french um in for a couple weeks in geneva i had already learned it to some degree but and they were, they sounded like Parisians or it sounded very native French, really? but they talked all the time about how much they hate the French. I'm surprised um, there wasn't a bigger difference between like the, in, in pronunciation, to be honest, but yeah. Oh, they hate the Well, French. there are, there, there definitely are. There are, um, in Geneva, they were generally spoke essentially standard, very, to my ear, very standard sounding. Um, certainly the few people I interacted with, which were very few, which were the teachers and um, they were just sound pretty normal um like the parisian french i had or the basic standard uh france french that i had studied hitherto italians though again they also love accents um yeah so i don't know yeah well i yeah. so i think we're too hard on ourselves in general potentially yeah french you have to get really right probably <laughs> I, I, I i've always had such a lot of even though the like the components of of, of french phonology um theoretically shouldn't be that out of reach i i've always just found it so hard to put them together in a way that's convincing um but this I mean, one of the things is nasal vowels because i'm really inconsistent in my ability to do those because sometimes they come out sounding all right to me and sometimes they come out sounding really over the top i imagine there are different degrees of nasalization even if most languages just distinguish between the two but mm. there like was an oral posture thing that they helped me with when I was in Geneva, and this is four years ago or something, um, and uh, I found like um, like the, like uh, e n and a n are merged, right? And uh, they're they're on, and I was doing like on, like like on, and they were like like no no like you know like on oh, 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 baguette, oh, oh. like they're like do that like on, oh. and they're like oh yeah. So it, it, now I don't know if I'm still doing it right. At the time, they said I was doing it correctly, which is a real, a significant lowering of the, I guess, larynx of all, oh, all oh, of the, uh, of uh, all, oh. all, um, oh, yeah, like all, uh, oh, like um, marchand, Ma marchand, sorry, marchand, because you can't want to, don't want to confuse it with on, oh, on, because that's very different, on oh, and on, oh, um, as opposed to un, which is different. <laughs> yeah, so this is, this is another level of, yeah. Because I know French has a large, larger vowel inventory than other Romance languages, doesn't it? Maybe I'm wrong. With the nasal, I think it's probably Portuguese because they have a nasalized version of each one. Okay. And they have open and closed. And oh, and they have lax vowels. Is it set? Is it set away Portuguese, the, the quality distinction? Or is it? I think it's eight. eight. It's got to be eight because Italian has seven. And... I mostly have looked at port, uh, Brazilian Portuguese, and there's um, a reduced uh sound, like final a ah becomes like I think it's uh, goiza for thing goiza. I think that's right. Correct me in the comments, Portuguese speakers. I think it's go goiza or I don't know um, fala. So, um, and then you have the reduction of final o and e to essentially u and e. Okay. In other positions, they 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 change, and it's it's um, it's it's uh, a great big mambo samba of of vowel dancing and nasalization, and it's 
it's uh carnival it's ca- carnival uh <laughs> every day i was like the gia but i'm not sure if that's actually how you say that that intonation thing is also how a spanish friend of mine is half spanish and half welsh which makes for a fun accent but wow a spanish friend of mine always did portuguese words like whenever he was translating a spanish word to portuguese he'd always do like this the kind of the intonation thing um, and that's another annoying thing in um, like what well, actually like with the the oral posture and stuff it's it's something that in reconstructions it's it's just an extra thing that you don't know about the historical language variety is the exact oral posture and how wide you have to open your mouth and stuff like that because you can make comments about vowel quality and stuff but then yeah and intonation well, as well something exactly beyond yeah. the stress um Intoni- that's a really good point and that's that's something i i'm fascinated by uh when it comes to reconstruction of say latin ancient greek too um in latin i'm be- oh, sorry no please go ahead i i, I was just going to say when i've heard you speak latin it's it's sounded intonation wise similar to how i how i've heard italian is that would you say that yay that- well it's great because um uh pretty much everyone not from italy including say general like i find span like i think So here's my, uh, in general, the reactions I've gotten. Um, In general, Mm -hmm. people say, yes, my Latin sounds like it has an Italian character, which is awesome because that's, that is very deliberate why I'm doing what I'm doing. And I'll explain why in a a moment. And I get really positive feedback from native speakers of Portuguese. They, they write uh, that, uh, oh, that, that, oh, you sounds that's so, that's like the best sounding Latin pronunciation I've ever heard. Okay. That's nice. Um, and uh, the uh, and generally positive from Spanish uh, Germans and Anglophones, if they if they like what I'm doing, they'll say or they might like or might not, but they might say, "Accuse me of why are you making Latin sound like Italian?" Mm-hmm. Because to them, Latin should sound like it has like their teacher who was from Germany, who was from right. England, who was from the U.S., who sounded <laughs> like they were just a native Germanic language speaker. That why would it sound like it? Like it doesn't occur to them that uh, it would have anything different. Than the intonation or they would use themselves right yeah. which is interesting kind of as a linguistic I, and i understand that point of view um and then of course there's the italians who for two reasons will say that i don't sound italian when i speak latin and they're good reasons um more or less the first kind of obvious one is that italy is the in Italy, Latin is it, the uh, per capita studying of a, both ancient Greek and Latin is highest in Italy. Right. Ancient Greek may be slightly higher in Greece itself per capita, but certainly sheer number of people, Italians study those two classical languages more than anyone else. It's like 10 times as much as the French. And there are, the French come in pretty close as well as um, <clears throat> the English. Um, but uh, the, and the Germans to uh, another extent, but so huge amounts of people study Latin, but they're the, also the only place at the academic level where the ecclesiastical pronunciation is normal. Right. There are a few teachers in Italy, and it's becoming more and more common, especially for people who speak Latin, to choose the international reconstructed uh, ancient accents of Latin, hmm. which they don't have to do. It's like, it's like us. British accents understand American accents with very little trouble, especially with a lifetime of hearing both. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but there are people who just, they're not used to the ecclesiastical pronunciation or vice versa. So if Italians hear me or anyone using that pronunciation system saying for dinner, saying gena instead of cena, they freak out. And they're like, you're doing it wrong. It's not magnus, it's magnus, yeah. those kinds of things. And they, I get at least a comment a day from an Italian. And then I say, no, I say in Italian, no, you're wrong. Here's why. Here, what, please watch this video, you know. Or I may have just linked them to a video. I've just, I've long given up being polite to these people. <laughs> yeah. Not their fault. It's just because, you know, if you've only heard one pronunciation and if you're tell, told that letter A, letter E makes E, and I say edificium and not edificium, they flip out. And I get it. So that's one, one reason where I wouldn't sound Italian. But the other aspect, which is I, quite a bit more legitimate, is the fact that I do have several significant um, Anglophone characteristics. Well, to me, they're significant that an Italian will pick up on um, is that, certain vowel quality. Go ahead. Excuse me. Is that a sort of accidental thing or is that, that, that something you consciously sort of... Oh, no, it's accidental. Uh, <laughs> some of the vowel quality stuff we talked about that I've had confusions with with central uh, and 
true mid, not centrals, but true mid vowels and making higher or lower um, differentiations. Um, schwas that get in there yeah. that um, won't be necessarily as noticeable, but are quite noticeable to an Italian ear, especially because schwa, schwa, schwa in pronunciation is characteristic of, say, certain dialects of Italian, like Neapolitan. Right. It's, it, so it's, it strikes as being not standard Italian and not necessarily native Italian either. It's very um, Englishy uh, for sure. And, uh, and a few other things. And, my, and above all, intonation patterns. My intonation patterns are definitely like you've heard me try to do. I'm trying to do Italian stuff, but if I'm uh, like, uh, I've, <laughs> I've, I've, I've uh, confused my girlfriend on more than a couple of times uh, because when I, I speak Italian, I might use an intonation pattern, which comes to me naturally. And she's, and it's like, it is a question or it's not a question. And she thinks it's the opposite. Right. And I realized that, and I've had, it's, which has helped me a lot to us. Oh no, I'm using the wrong one, which means I've been using the wrong one in, a, in Latin. No. If I want to use Italian one, I see. Yeah. which is my intent. Now, why would I do that? Um, well, my opinion would be that if we want to approach uh, Latin as an actual language that can be spoken, then if we do that in generally went to want, want to actually learn a, uh, a pronunciation system and an intonation system and other characteristics, hand gestures, all kinds of things that go with, with, um, with that culture. Mm -hmm. Latin is a language that's very old and there were no tape recorders as I've been reminded by several very clever comments. Uh, <laughs> so I'm sure you have <laughs> gotten a few of those too. Have you gotten those? Has that been an annoyance or are they? I have. It's one of the, I'll, I'll talk about it a bit more after you, because I'm interested. Oh, good. In I'll, so I'll finish it up quickly. And I'd love to hear because oh, no, I, yeah, I mean, don't be quick about uh, it. I want to hear about your tape recorder comment stories. Um, and the, oh gosh, I lost one. Oh, yeah. So the answer, why would I try to sound specifically Italian mm -hmm. or specifically to try to incorporate standard modern Italian things? And the reason is because. It, um, we ha so there's a, a wonderful website, which I'd have to find, which has samples. Actually, there's two of them. They're great. They have samples of all the romance languages uh, and words, specific words, phrases. There's two of them of like all the, and by romance languages, I mean the hundreds of variations and dialects yeah. all across the Mediterranean. And it's amazing. Um, and uh, what that, that has done for me as a non-native speaker of those la languages and just kind of hearing them, because I don't know about you, but to me, especially before I knew either language really well, Spanish and Italian sound kind of similar, right? I would say, I, I would have thought, yeah. I think, yeah. I like to think I could distinguish between them now, but definitely. Oh, yeah. you can definitely distinguish them, but they have a, like their intonational patterns and their, their, there's something more similar about them from our English speaking yeah. perspective than is different, yeah. I would say. And my um, non-statistical analysis uh, holistically listening to all the Romance languages, to a lesser extent, French, which is lost stress accent, so it's going to sound very different with the way it's timed. Um, but for the most part, they generally have a lot of things in common. Catalan, Sardinian, um, the uh, Neapolitan, Sicilian, Romanian. Um, now, if you tell any native speaker of those that, say, like, Romanian sounds like Italian, they'll say, you're full of crap. Yeah. Italians especially don't like that comparison, actually. <laughs> I don't think Romanians like it either. Um, but uh, but gosh, they sound super similar. In fact, if Romanian lost the final O or the final of like masculine words like Italian has, if you put those on, they would be, it would, they would, their intonation pattern would sound super Italian. And I tried doing it and getting some Romanians to do it. And it's like, hey, that sounds like Italian. Without it, it sounds more sl slavic -y or more... Frenchy a little bit without the final. Yeah. It's very interesting. So it's how those those rhythmic timings um, influence the perception. So in general, my opinion and my recommendation are for people who want to recite uh, Latin in an ancient to imitate an ancient accent would be to utilize a known intonation and other non IPA based qualities. Quality is a terrible term. Characteristics whether it's Spanish based, uh, I'd say Spanish or, or Italian are probably the best to go with because they're very well-known languages. They don't have a lot of fun, bizarre things in them. Like say Portuguese has a lot of nasal vowels and a lot of vowel reduction. 
Latin probably shouldn't have, Latin doesn't have schwas like that. It shouldn't, at least if we're reconstructing classical pronunciation. Spanish and standard Italian don't either. Mm. Um, but uh, uh, as a point to start with, probably French is not a very good guide for a variety of reasons. Portuguese to a lesser extent, but it's still still better. Just Catalan, absolutely. Sardinian, absolutely. Sicilian, absolutely. Neapolitan, absolutely. It just using a anything like that, if you just happen to know one of those languages and you want to pronounce Latin with those kinds of... Um, secondary characteristics that is my recommendation i've chosen because they're more similar to each other than not and i've been choosing and trying to make it sound more like italian not just to try to sound less anglophone mm -hmm. but also to more recently to appeal more to italians because a lot of italians study latin and if i sound like an italian who's using a restored pronunciation instead of the ecclesiastical pronunciation i think i can win more people over to just accept that pronunciation system. They don't need to use it. They can use whatever they want. Yeah. I use ecclesiastical pronunciation system all the time. Um, but just to accept that it's a thing that's okay. That's I I've I've always liked your the way that you sort of accept both ecclesiastical and classical pronunciation and are. There's a time I didn't though. Um, I think it's one of it seems like one of those academic things that everybody kind of goes through. There's a kind of period Okay, that's not in the way. There's a period of being a bit kind of snobbish about one or the other, or yeah. And then there's a you sort of go into yeah, like with old English, there was a, a whole. It's not the, the same in that there's no kind of recorded. Uh, there's well, there's no distinction between like an ecclesiastical pronunciation that's used nowadays and a you know classical pronunciation. But mm -hmm. I, I definitely went through a phase of. Um, preferring certain reconstructions and then like having what? my own ideas about reconstruction. I think when I did, when I developed my own ideas, I kind of went into the realms of, this was before I knew much about phonology and before, before I was on YouTube or anything like that. Um, but it was, well, this doesn't sound very natural if I say it, I think this should sound more natural. So I'll m do something that sounds more natural to me, which, which effectively mm. meant reduce a vowel that that there's no evidence that it was reduced or something <clears throat> like that yeah. um, one of the things alex foreman does which i really appreciate is um in sort of 15 1600s reconstructions he pronounces vowels with their full quality or i mm. a lot of the time um will reduce them and i think that there is there is actual descriptive evidence from back then that unstressed vowels were had different qualities from each other and weren't all just reduced to schwa. What kind of examples could you throw out? Um, I can't think. So. I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can. If, yeah, if you, if you have them handy and a... I may edit this, <laughs> me searching out so that it's not just me. If I go to the Cambridge book and type in unstressed vowel, there might be a... Mm. Uh, Oh, it seems like there's kind of mixed evidence from the mid 1600s to the to the mid 1700s really? that there were examples different. Um, so the example that's given here is I don't want to just read verbatim off the page, but um, this no, go is ahead. Johnston 1764, which I'll give the full reference to in the description. Um, but he it says that he describes a number of weak vowel qualities which are clearly not spelling artifacts. Short orthographic. I, which it, which this author interpret, I think this is Roger Latt interprets as being I in suffixes like ibble, like um, laudable, laudable, yeah, yeah, so is it laud laudable. I think it's I, so like laud. I th when is this seventeen? So I think that would be like yeah, laudable, and laudable, then, or maybe with a with dark L, laudable, laudable, and then the same in edge and then the same in in although i can't work out what that's a i n i can't think of any um, and then short curtain 
Oh yeah, I suppose, yeah. Curtain. Yeah, yeah. curtain. Um, shu a in shus was shus, shun as in like t-i-o-n, um, and then short e in re, which... So instead of um, um, pr pronunciation, pronunciation, like that? Pronunciation. Pronunciation, I don't, I can't remember my, I'm, and I'm not, I don't know what, what even century I'm trying to do. No, I mean, this is the mid 1700s, yeah. which I, I yeah, I, I, I'm not sure what I'd automatically go for for that. Imagination, imagination, imagination. Magic. I think that's, I think that's a time where there was, the, we're starting to see evidence of the sh rather than imagine, imagination with the sia kind of thing, but yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think actually part, some of that's from um, uh, the late 1700s is from what's the Webster? No, no Webster, who, who yeah. sort of went through a, a number of different authors um, who had commented on pronunciation and said that mm. um, pr pronunciations of those kinds of words with sh should be rejected and you should hold on to pronunciations that sort of pronounce it in a more conservative way. Um, mm. Although I'm not sure what that conservative way was, whether it would be imagination or imagination, I'm not sure. Have you seen Ben Franklin's um, orthographic um, or a ph phonetic writing system? I haven't, although I think Jack, I think Jackson might have. No, somebody, somebody's suggested I look at that. Well, I don't think it was Jackson, actually. But It's so interesting. I would love it if you would, too, to compare it uh, to, um, because what, well, it's uh, it demonstrates a very different pronoun not a very but a a um, noticeably different pronunciation of either a British or American English but it seems kind of in between mm. I've also heard that uh, the r distinct regional difference between between British and North American English was not distinct in that time period until like the right. mid 1800s is that is that correct that that aligns more or less with why um mm what I've read yeah that it was that it, they they were almost indistinguishable from each other in throughout mm. the 1700s maybe towards the end of the 1700s people could start to tell the difference but I wonder whether that was just um, that could still have just been an English person from say the southeast interacting with an American whose ancestors came from a different bit of the a different bit of Europe or something well, like that gosh the variety there's definitely varieties of and on both continents just as there still are today yeah. Um, and probably more of them, but maybe the 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 uh, distance traveled was was smaller. I don't know, but um, I w and just as a, an idea, if you're interested, I'd love if uh, if you looked at at it and then compared it with what you know about British accents that are contemporary mm -hmm. to see that ah, because this is the the um, hypothesis was the thesis. Hypo I don't remember how to do this. The idea hypothesis yeah. is that Ben Franklin demonstrates pronunciation system general to all native English speakers, at least of both British and American of uh, the late 1700s. And then you could actually prove or disprove that. I think that would be fascinating. That is interesting. I'm trying yeah. to do an American English um, video at the moment, which hopefully will be the next one that comes out. Um, Great. But that sounds like a very interesting way of expanding on that, because I realize I've not done much on American English just because I've been scared of going in and getting a load of things wrong. Um, like I'm, there are, there are various things like how the weak vowel merger played out and things like that, which I, I, I'm not confident that I know a huge amount about. So it's kind of- um, As you always do, have a nice little caveat in the beginning, but, your, your findings and insights, go from, go, take them from your, the, the, the personal and make them public so we can share and 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 the, the curiosities whether people disagree that's fine that's the yeah. way to find out right yeah it's true. tape I, recorder I stories do you have time for tape recorder stories tape recorder stories comments where people complain that we don't have uh, audio recordings of the oh, past right yeah um i can't there are it's the thing about this is i it's one of those things where people are happy to accept, for example, that we know certain historical events happened, despite not having video recordings of them happening. But people, I, I think it's because people see language as a kind of, um, uh, well, not all people, but many people see language as a kind of 
um, for pronunciation at least, it's a kind of vague ethereal thing that that goes over the top of what you're saying, rather than something that's mechanical and systematic and, and scientific. And scientific and has very strong patterns. And the difference between my accent and your accent can be quantified and described in a really precise way. Um, mm -hmm. And such that if a person has sufficient uh, control of the um, uh, organs of, of, uh, of speech, they can reproduce uh, either of our, yeah. Yeah, that would be fun. Let's let's uh, <laughs> maybe we can try that in the future if you're up for it. Yeah, that could, I love. That could be fun. Can can I do an impression of of Simon Roper? Can Simon Roper do an impression of Luke Ranieri? That would be cool. That is interesting. Yeah, I think that would yeah. be fun. One. And if yeah. we fail, it'll be del delightful. Uh, it'll be just as it'll great as if we succeed. Um, but yeah, it's just the the idea that um, you can't take those systematic patterns, project them back, combine them in, in many cases. Um, in English post sort of mid 1500s and in Latin in general in the classical period um, you know people were describing the way they pronounced things and people were giving really at least at least in the case of English really quite mechanical descriptions of how they were producing certain sounds um, oh yeah likewise yeah so it's it's yeah. I think that there's there are comparisons of r like r to a dog noise in both English from that period and Latin. And yes, thank you for bringing that because I remember um, Crystal saying that, oh, it's the doggy sound, the sonos caninos or something. Um, the sonos caninos, the, I think that's what it's described as the canine sound, the doggish uh, sound. And he just liberally said, oh, it's er. Yeah, I don't, I, don't, I think that was, that was plucking, clutching at straws a little bit. I think that's just one of those. What sound is a dog like? How do you transcribe that in IPA? It's given identically for the Latin grammarians. Really? And, the, and there, of course, there's describing ra. Yeah, so there, you, there we are, people, different people. In terms right. Of, that's the thing. But, like, but er, especially if we don't natively have a ra, then er. Uh, we're not going to describe a dog as doing ra. Italians will, Spaniards yeah. will. Um, but we'll go er. Maybe we'll go er. And we'll do like a, a uvular yes. triller or something. But. but yeah, well, it's one of those things where you could argue for days about whether the person, whether by the dog sound, the person is more likely to mean or rrr. But the fact that people disagree about it nowadays means that back then it would have been just as ambiguous whether, like, I mean, whichever sound you had in your native language, that's the one you, you'd associate with the dog sound. And it's there's a similar thing like I, I'll put on screen where it comes from because I can't remember the top of my head, but there's someone in, I think, the early 1700s who describes... The, the trap vowel as like the, the vowel quality that a sheep makes when it bah. Bah, which which sounds like ash to me um but it's i agree i suppose well, that's, yeah. guess what guess what vowel that corresponds to for italians in the uh the diction course that i've been taking is it the open a eh. bah. 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 i wonder is... how much quality variation there is among how like like because I, I think most sheep i've heard produce something that's basically uh, <laughs> but but how many papers have been written about the diachronic changes in sheep voices <laughs> that's not something I've we are sub it's, i'm just kidding but i think it is perfectly reasonable to assume that sheep now sound like sheep hundreds or thousands of years ago uh, you know that's actually true i mean like people from comp comparing um oh if a french author or Italian author makes this comment about pronunciation of, of English. We can't assume it's the same as modern Italian pronunciation that they're comparing it to. Maybe sheep. It, they're all yeah. moving targets. Shocking amount. Yeah, they are. Yeah. It's incredibly frustrating. I mean, that's one way to try to triangulate Latin. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to, like, I wanted to choose a pronunciation so I could finally learn ancient Greek well. Yeah. Um, because I was, the, the um, classical pronunciation of ancient Greek just was not being understood by people um, because of the aspirates, mm -hmm. among other factors. But that was the primary factor. So, okay, well, I, I like classical Rome anyway. That's kind of my thing. And ancient Greek reached its, um, its, uh, its apex in classical Rome, not in Athens, uh, though it was obviously very important then. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so 
still like that's where the that's the flourishing of you know the library of alexandria and all these things and cleopatra that's 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 the greek and then lucian in the second century a.d one of the most um celebrated authors of ancient greek is second century a.d at the end of roman uh classical period so um so i was like okay i want to want to choose uh choose that that actual time period oh gosh i had a at a point that i just forgot darn it i had something because i had something else i wanted to talk about which was the subjectivity um Darn, I hope I remember what I was talking about. Or with the dog sound kind of thing, subjectivity of interpretation. Yeah, well, right. And the um, the uh, the subjectivity of, oh yeah, great. The, those three, at least three, okay, I remember two of them. One of the, <laughs> one is that the Greeks also describe, the, like the actual bleating of sheep is written in Greek as letter beta, letter eta, right. which transcribed in the Latin alphabet in classical Latin would be letter B, letter E with a long vowel. So be be. And the eta, that's also one of the reasons that we know that, that eta, among other reasons, when it was adopted in 403 BC into standard Athenian dialect, uh, ancient Greek, that it must have been an open, long e. Eh. Um, the um, uh, Belgian, uh, Dutch, Flemish has this actually the same contrast as classical Greek, where they have a, a short e. Eh. But they, which is a kind of a true mid vowel, eh, it's not particularly high or low, but they have a long e and a long e, eh, just like classical Greek of um, the fifth century BC. Yeah. So we know that, that this long e, eh, so it's be, be, but do you know how that would be pronounced in modern Greek? Written letter beta, letter eta? What's that? V, V. <laughs> okay. Which, well, and there are still yeah. Greek grammarians that argue that classical pronunciation oh there are linguists who say they i i have i have heard the sheep they say vv every day <laughs> what do you what <laughs> no they have yeah they, <laughs> if you just if you just assume that the classical authors were all very wrong in the exact same direction um... well it, it seems much more likely uh that at least whenever when when be, be was used in greek that's the sound it had be, be, not 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 B B or V V or something that happened later. Although it's it's just because of the universality of that onomatopoeia and in, in languages that aren't related to each other. So it's a reasonable uh, hypothesis, I would say. Um, subjectivity. Sound. Oh, go ahead, Simon. Sorry. I, I was just going to say the animal sounds thing seems a lot more helpful than the moving target. You know. Oh, that's what. Yeah, just because they're moving. That's why I, I remember. Thank you, moving target. Because when you, especially if you're just dealing with ancient Greek in the classical period, you have nothing consistent to compare it to. But by the classical, or at least the early uh, or mid-Roman Republican period, we have transcriptions of two languages. And yeah, they're both moving targets, but at least you can triangulate a little bit and have some kind of certainty. To each other so that you have a sort of hanging idea yeah. of where they are in relation to each other, even if not in relation to modern English. Exactly. The reason oh. that... Um, uh, for example, Italian has a che and je sound, mm -hmm. and those are trans. In modern Greek, they do those as tse and ze, tse and ze. They don't do them as ke and ge, which, and that's a very consistent. Uh, usually, che and je, if a language doesn't have that, and they only have a simple, relatively <laughs> simple system, they use just sibilants. Um, and the fact that ancient Greek does a kappa regularly for, say, I don't know, can't think of a a Kaisar for Caesar okay. shows that it's wasn't, wasn't yeah, yeah. Caesar, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. So at least that's very helpful to compare the two languages. Uh, last thing I want to say on subjectivity of languages is um, no matter, I think no matter how hard we try, we'll always have some kind of subjective bias, but for people who really think that like, like they know, like they, like they, they also, it's not just like they have um, perhaps an overconfidence, which is true of probably all of us at any given moment in some respect, yeah. but also that they're, they're inter like you're talking about, oh, that sounds more natural to me without having studied certain vowel, uh, lax vowels or something li like that. Um, I'm thinking of the uh, Italians say, if they've only heard the ecclesiastical pronunciation and if, they, if these are rather stubborn Italians we happen to be talking about, they would just, re automatically reject any reconstructions because to them they don't sound natural yeah. and then they over rationalize and try to find like oh no the uh, ecclesiastical pronunciation was the pronunciation in the roman empire which it wasn't um that kind of thing anyway i find it all endlessly fascinating
I wonder if, because this isn't something that happens much with Old English because it's so, so inaccessibly different to modern English, even orthographically, that people don't tend to kind of do this. But I wonder, I wonder about this with Old Norse as well and with Latin, whether because with Old Norse, the example would be from sort of Old Norse spelling to Icelandic pronunciation um, or from classical Latin spelling to modern Italian pronunciation. I wonder if part of the reason that people reject a, a, non, a non-native Italian speaker's interpretation of that with reconstructed historical pronunciation is because it makes it look more... I, I, so an example from Old Norse would be like a double L in Old Norse spelling comes out as k in Icelandic. So right. like T, I think voiceless L, I could be wrong. Um, yeah. So if an Icelander hears uh, someone who's a native English speaker pronouncing Old Norse and just pronouncing that as ul, then I wonder whether the, the instinct is to think, oh, that's just an English speaker not knowing the complexities of our spelling system. In a I believe that's language. exactly what... There's a YouTube channel of an Icelandic um, woman who's uh, tried to correct people's pronunciation of, say... I've seen that. Uh, of Norse... Ka- Ka- I mean, so I think she makes fine videos, but she's wrong because she keeps pronouncing... Assuming that I- modern Icelandic pronunciation, just like Greeks do, just like certain Italians will do, will assume that is the only pronunciation and that everything else must be just a foreignism. Hmm. Barbarism, foreignism. <laughs> I thought it was foreignism, but, but yeah, I suppose the, the equivalent in English would be people assuming that, um, I don't know, Shakespeare was read in a modern RP accent or, or a modern US accent oh, or yeah. like that, whereas it, it was really just an accent that isn't, that maybe sounds a bit familiar, but... Um, the average American would assume it's uh, modern RP because I that's what they hear in the movies. That's that's how most people in the UK would... would um, yeah, those people in the UK would have seen as well. They would. Just, I remember even doing some theater stuff with some Shakespeare and trying to, and uh, students, even maybe myself, were trying to maybe do it in a British accent because it just sounded like more. That's the way you do it, right? Yeah. And then the teacher might say, "No, no, no, just just use your native, normal way of speaking English. Don't try to force something because you'll you won't be able to. It's going to block you from getting to the character. Yeah, the, yeah, that kind absolutely. Of thing. Yeah. I think that's right because no. Unless you're going to go really hard on it and spend... Do it correctly. Do it well, yeah. Yeah. Like if you taught every single actor, this is the phonology you need to follow to a T. Learn this so, so well that you can just do it with your own voice and then get into character when you're not thinking about the pronunciation anymore. But how expensive would it be to do that to a cast of at least 10? We need to make more videos. Make an instruction video set. Well, you, and, there, yeah. and there you go. And then everybody in the world can watch it. Sure. And if they don't learn it, it's their own fault. That's true. <laughs> yeah, they have no excuse anymore. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, I'll have to try and get in touch with Alex Foreman because I've been wanting to talk to mm. him for a while. But, um, but yeah. Good luck. Thank you. I will, I he's will. Noticed, he's uh, notoriously slippery, but maybe since yeah. you've called him out and lauded him, he will, hopefully, uh, because uh, I think a conversation between the two of you would be... Um, Extremely meritorious. And between the two of you as well. Oh gosh, you. that would be... I'd love that. I've, I've never uh, uh, been able to catch that... Um, um, I was going to say call him a slippery eel or a fish or something, but that seems pejorative. And I, <laughs> and I adore what he does, so that doesn't sound right. But he's hard to get hold of. Um, good luck. I hope you do. I may have to scurry off now to a... Thank you. Simon, thank you so much for having me, and uh, my um, uh, thanks as well to uh, your audience for for watching our conversation today. Thank you very, very much for for coming on, um, giving giving your own time. Uh, I, I'd be happy to do that um, that thing on your channel at some point. Yes, um, in the future, you'll come, uh, and I'll speak Latin at you, and you speak English, and we'll see how much you understand. Yeah, and we'll see how much well, that'll you, be fun. You understand? No, I'm joking, but yeah. <laughs> Um, I'll yeah, feel free to use whatever form of English or other language you like. Yeah, I'll, I'll learn something really obscure just just for for that specific video, and then never use it again. Optime, awesome.